For modern nations, perpetual economic growth is the ultimate mark of success. But on a planet with finite resources, our unfettered consumption is already driving many of the natural systems that we rely on to the brink of collapse. I'm Russell Beard, and on this Earthrise special, we'll be meeting some of the people who are reimagining the relationship between economics and the environment. In the next two decades, our population is expected to reach 8 billion, with an extra 2 billion becoming middle class consumers. With economies in crisis and the effects of climate change already evident, some alternative financial models are starting to gain traction. So we come to meet Andrew Sims from the New Economics Foundation. He's going to talk to us about why he thinks economic growth can continue. So Andrew, tell us what's wrong with the old economics. Why can't we keep on growing? Well, in a nutshell, Old-fashioned economists will tell you the way to solve the world's problems and tackle poverty is not to divide the cake more evenly, but it's to bake a bigger cake. But we simply don't have the choice to bake a bigger planet. We've got to deal with what we've got in front of us. What's the alternative to our business as usual continued economic growth model? There's plenty of evidence from history that shows that when push comes to shove and the need is there, societies can radically change how they live and how they consume and not necessarily be worse off for it. Because there's an awful lot of research that shows that in spite of all the, you know, the stuff that we like to build up in our homes, all the spare consumer durables, the electronic gadgets, etc., that these don't actually really make us any happier. So why can't we just separate environmental impact and economic growth? Well, some of the best climate scientists in the field have looked at whether the countries which are already rich can continue to grow without causing catastrophic climate change and come to the conclusion that, no, they can't. Can we just keep on growing? and reduce our environmental impact by improving efficiency and Even advances allowing in for renewable the, for energies. The, for the, for the, the best leaps forward in energy efficiency and introducing clean renewable technologies, growth would have to reduce. But by moving to a more fair and equal distribution, people wouldn't have to be hit hard by that. One of the massive um, caveats to your um, argument is uh, different playing fields we're talking about terms of developing and, and developed countries. Where some of the poorest nations in the world are concerned, as they struggle to meet their basic human needs, mm. their economies are going to grow. And that's not a bad thing. They also have an opportunity to leapfrog the kind of phase of dirty development that we went through. But that makes it even more important that where the rich, already rich countries are concerned, we shrink our impact on the environment so that poor countries have got the space, the environmental space, to be able to develop. So can you actually imagine a politician standing there on a podium and arguing for a low or even no growth economy? Do you not think that that would be political suicide? We've got a whole parade of politicians now. Going back to Bobby Kennedy, who said the irony about economic growth is that it measures everything apart from that which is truly worthwhile. Right up to the French president, our own prime minister before he became elected, questioning this. The head of our financial services authority, Nobel Prize winning economists, all lining up to say that we've kind of got this wrong for quite a long time and need to rethink it. So it's happening. But for many, the idea of a complete halt to economic growth is just not feasible. Professor Colotta Perez argues that we can solve both our environmental and our economic crises. The only way out of this financial crisis is to save the planet. So in fact, what I think is that green growth is the solution to the current recession. It could sound like a contradiction in terms. You're talking about green growth. Yes. So not, is that not an oxymoron? Uh, not really. The reason why we believe that growth is all about materials, energy and all that is because the mass production revolution created a way of living, a lifestyle, that was based in that. So what we now need is to take advantage of the potential of information technology to change direction. And the best change of direction is precisely green. Because it means changing products in such a way that they're durable, so that you have 
a whole range, you know, instead of having one person consuming the same product five times, mm. you would have one product being used by 50 people along 25 or 30 years. Mm -hmm. You can have employment, for instance, in maintenance and refurbishing and so on, and you have the spare parts and you have... That creates a lot of jobs. There's that other school of thought that think at the end of the day, this is a finite planet. No matter how green the growth is, growth is just not sustainable. And they're talking about low growth or even no growth. What do you think about that idea? I think that is the most unrealistic proposal anybody in the whole history of mankind has ever proposed. You cannot tell people, too bad, you know, we had it good, you're not having it good. And how about the developing countries? Mm. Zero growth, are you mad? Mm. So technology, you think, is going to save us? As long as you have the right policies. Mm. Because policies have to direct technology by changing the market, tilting the playing field. So that if you invest in innovating in the direction of green, you are more profitable. Immediately people would naturally innovate in the direction of green instead of innovating in the old mass production obsolete direction. It would become bad taste. It would become vulgar. And if the rich begin, like they are now, having electric cars and having solar panels, and that's luxurious, everybody will want to have that. So it's not about guilt, it's not about fear, it's not about controlling, it's about making it better. Many argue that continued economic growth is necessary to provide food for our rapidly growing population, but others believe that rather than increasing production, we just need to use what we have more wisely. I've come to Lincolnshire in the east of England to meet author and campaigner Tristram Stewart. Now, he's a big thinker who's dedicated his entire career to reducing the amount of food that goes to waste worldwide. How are you doing, Tristan? Russell? Good nice. to meet you, Russell. Nice to meet you too, man. Yeah, working hard. This is beautiful. Absolutely gorgeous. Thanks. A lot of cabbage here, man. This There's a, a lot, lot of cabbage. I mean, what we really need is a, is a very big truck. We're in a field that's being used to try out new crop varieties. This stuff has no commercial value and would just be left there. 
and not harvested. There's absolutely nothing wrong with them, but they're just not being grown yet on a commercial scale. We're here to save these rejects from the plough. So what's the plan? So the plan is, you see a cabbage on the ground, Yeah. you grab it and you take off the outer leaves. <laughs> <laughs> At least a third of the entire world's food supply is currently wasted. That's just shocking. We're currently chopping down forests in places like South America, Southeast Asia, Central Africa to grow more and more food. If we need to increase the global food supply, if we need to reduce our impact on the environment, what I'm saying is the amount of food that we're wasting is a really good place to start. Is that when we're talking about wasting food, it's not just the, it's not just the food, is it? That has taken irrigation water, it's taken fossil fuels, but most importantly, it comes down to land. Land is our most important asset. Tristram is working to forge links between food producers and charities which can make use of waste produce like this. Tristram, we've got a couple of uh, rogue cabbages here. Yeah, coming back for them, because <laughs> there's a few more at the end of the line. I'm not going to leave them behind. All right, no cabbage left behind. <laughs> Got space for one more. Yes, come on then. Go on then. Good stuff. Well, I think we've done pretty well. Yeah. We're definitely going to fill this vehicle, and that is a lot of cabbage. <laughs> but Tristram's not the only one who believes in wasting less rather than producing more. We're off to a cooperative run supermarket that's committed to cutting food waste. We've been talking to Tristan and hearing some quite like astounding yeah. statistics about the amount of food that we're wasting yeah. each year. I understand that's kind of core to That's core cool to us. To your, well, that's why we put the kitchen in yeah. to do that. And we reckon we save around about between 18 and 20 tonnes of food waste a year. In the UK, 20 to 40% of produce is rejected before it even reaches supermarkets, usually because it doesn't meet their stringent cosmetic standards. I mean, these are, yeah, you, these look like you've Apples you might get in your garden, yeah. you pulled off a tree. They're, we're just so used to seeing apples in the supermarket that are just... Yeah. Perfect. Here's some perfectly shaped Shakes, ones, but maybe not perfectly sized. No, that's they're quite right. Little, they're they? little, they're dinky little apples. Aren't yeah. they really cute? Look at that, they're a lovely cute. little apple. Do you think you waste less by coming here? Oh, definitely, yeah. And I think find that things last a lot longer. Some of this stuff, it maybe looks a little bit, maybe odd shapes. I welcome at any time the, the all shaped vegetables. I'm an all shaped person, so I like the all shaped vegetables. Do I say? Across town in Trafalgar Square, Tristram and his team are on a mission to give Londoners a little food for thought. They're giving away 5,000 plates of curry made from those cabbages we rescued and other food that would have ended up in the bin. Just had the delivery of the curry. He will come in here, 5,000 people, we're hoping. It's not just about the curry, no, is it? Absolutely no, absolutely not. We've got a lot of other things going on. We've got the apple pressing. Uh, we collect apples from people who have too many apples in their gardens and in orchards. Next to them are the pigs. Yeah. They will be eating some of the apple pulp that's left over from the pressing, okay. showing that all food, even if it's not fit for human consumption, can be used for something. Well, I'm certainly going to queue up along with the rest of them. Thanks very Good much. Stuff. Good luck with the rest of the Cheers. day and um, congratulations. Thanks, mate. The very first curry is being served up by London celebrity mayor Boris Johnson. So they, yeah. so they discriminated against the yes. wonky vegetables. They do. Okay. They've discriminated yeah. against yes. against mutant against the vegetables. Wonky vegetables. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Yeah, it's very good. You put a slice of stale bread in the oven and then you put it in a bag, you bang it with a rolling pin and you've got, you've got bread some bread crumbs. Crumbs. Oh, is it? Roughly 25% of the fruit that we grow goes in the bin. What? Yeah. Is that true? Supermarkets don't take them because they think people won't buy them because of their shape, size. So they're going to throw them away? Yeah, they were going to throw them away. That's not good, is it? No, I pledge to reduce my food waste, and I want businesses to do the same. OK, that's a good idea. I'll, 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 I'll say that. I'll your email to know about that. OK, let's see. Ooh. That's a 
with some wonky apple juice, but I think you'll find it tastes delicious. God. In just two hours, thousands of people enjoyed a free lunch of curry and fresh juice and signed a pledge to reduce their food waste. There are huge environmental problems out there that we have very slim hope of solving, but this one at least, food waste, we can do it. And a whole legion of converts fell in love with wonky vegetables. There's something quite nice about a knobbly carrot or a tiny tomato. <laughs> <laughs> Economic growth is supposed to make us happier and healthier, but as the damaging effects of climate change and the financial crisis are felt around the world, increasing numbers of people are asking what we can do to improve the model. I'm going to Brixton in South London to visit a community that are trialling a new economic system, one that values people and planet as well as profit. Brixton is part of the growing Transition Town movement, a worldwide network of people who are reshaping their local economies to cut carbon emissions and build stronger communities. Josh, and it all starts with the Brixton Pound. The power to create and allocate money into the economy is probably the most important element of capitalism. And if we allow a load of large private uh, profit-making organisations that so uh, about banks. Yep, <laughs> they happen yeah. to be called banks yeah. to control it. Then the outcomes of our economy will reflect their objectives and their motives. And local currency is one way of sort of trying to take back some of that power and say, well, this is our town. We want to ensure that the way that money moves around actually supports the local economy. The Brixton pound can only be spent in local independent shops. Where does one get a Brixton pound? Where do we do this exchange? Well, one of the best places to get them is here in Morley's, um, where you can get them in the menswear department, actually. <laughs> this is not where you might imagine. I thought they might see Yeah, so this is an independently owned department store. You lead the way. I'm yeah, sure so I'd like to get sure some Brixton pounds, please. No problem, sir. Yeah. How many would you like? I think I'm going to go for 25, please. One Brixton pound is equivalent to one pound sterling, and there are currently 30,000 in circulation. Look at that. Thank you very much. What do you reckon about these Brixton pounds? I think it's quite cool Brixton has its own money. Yeah. Quite popular, especially the one with David Bowie. That's why we don't yeah. have any at the moment, oh, I'm right. afraid. Okay. What? You've got one with David Bowie on it? That's cool. The idea is still in its infancy, but already the Brixton Pound is accepted in 200 outlets. There it is. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Shopkeepers can only re-spend the currency with local suppliers, which helps create a market for locally grown and produced goods and cuts carbon emissions from transport. This is a Brixton Pound sauce. It's actually made from uh, ingredients in the market as well named after our little currency here We've in Brixton. We've got to buy some Brixton pound <laughs> sauce, come on. Yeah. So that's £10.50, please. £10.50. Well, that's good, it feels nice to be kind of contributing to a local economy, being absolutely sure that the money is staying here when we could have gone into a supermarket around the corner, bought three bottles of chilli sauce that may have been flown from halfway around the world, but we know for a fact that this has come yeah. from literally it's next been... door. Made in Brixton, using Brixton ingredients from the market, and the money is staying here and helping to pay our staff, who are all local. We become too dependent on these global supply chains, on these big supermarkets for everything. And if there is a shock to the system, if oil prices go up yeah. or there's a financial crisis, we're then really vulnerable. And more importantly, really, there isn't enough fossil fuels left to maintain this system. Yeah. So we need networks in place that make us adapt to a low energy future. Supporting local shops isn't the only way Brixton residents are moving away from a purely profit-driven economy. By rethinking the area's energy supply, Agamemnon Otero is taking sustainable business to new heights. So we'll take a little... Uh... Wow, nice view. That's where the energy used to come from. That's the energy station. That's where all the laws are made about who gets to have what energy and uh, the financing global capital right there. The banking center of the world. Yeah. The corporate model is they have one legal obligation. Give their shareholders the largest amount of profit in the shortest amount of time.
It doesn't matter if it's strip mining in Nigeria or Algeria. They just push and push and push. We want to be a viable financial company, but with social aims. Okay. Agamemnon runs London's first renewable ah, energy cooperative. Here we go. Here's some you, you made earlier. Yeah. This 58,000 pound solar array was paid for by over 100 local investors, most of whom live less than two kilometers away. It gives yeah. a sense of how it works. Okay, so these panels right now get generate energy and it powers the lifts in, in, this, in the communal spaces and then it's sold onto the grid. Okay. And we get a subsidy from, from the government for generating energy and then we get a per kilowatt from the energy company that buys it from us. Okay. That money, think of it as one big river. It's, we got a big flow. The first pot that it falls into, that goes into making sure the administration of these panels and the upkeep is done. Then the overflow goes into a community energy efficiency fund, which pays for education and apprenticeships. And then when that's full, it goes into the returns to the people. And they can have it in Brixton pounds, the local currency, or they can have it in pound sterling. If there's more than 3%, we're going to take the excess from that and put it back into the community energy efficiency fund. OK. That's how it works. I've got you. You don't have to have huge returns. You need to have reasonable returns over long periods of times, which facilitate the infrastructure you need, the well-being you need, the energy you need. And, um, and that's why decentralized, cooperatively owned renewable energy it stands in the face of all that. And you're looking at our next project right here. Soon, these five roofs will be covered with over 180 solar panels. Energy efficiency audits are funded by income from the panels, benefiting residents such as Shamsa Osman Guri. You see, this is a classic thing that everybody has here. You see, so you've got one, two, three things going in there, and then all those things are on standby. Because if you're leaving on standby, it uses a third of the energy. And then you can put this to say, I'm gonna, I want everything off at 12 o'clock. Yeah, have it turn off at 12. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, so that would reduce that amount, right? It can reduce that by 70%. More efficient fittings will help residents cut their bills and their carbon emissions. I hope it's a sign of hope. A lot of people can have the same thing. Take care. Bye. 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 Agamemnon hopes to transform this whole area and not just through energy. Okay, we can use that for solar. Those ones aren't so good for solar, but maybe they are good for solar thermal. What about this big green space here? Let's dig this up and turn it into a community garden. His other project is to create a chain of food plots at bus stops, starting with one right at the end of his street. We were talking about the garden. Somebody suggested, why don't we actually okay. work on it ourselves? And of course, what you've got is the youngsters getting involved, the old age pensions, such as, well, nearly, nearly late. It's really brought the street together. Like, since this is started, like, there's been a load of street parties and stuff like that. By valuing more than just profit, these communities are trying to create a more balanced and sustainable economy. People are fed up with the financing system the way it is, and they're fed up with the decisions being made for them, and they're fed up with the impact on the environment. And these are three ways where you can re-embed economics, which is taking over everything, into the community, and the community sits inside the environment. and for too long, we seem to have surrendered personal excellence and community values in the mere accumulation of material things. Our gross national product counts air pollution and cigarette advertising, and ambulances to clear our highways of carnage. It counts the destruction of the redwood and the loss of our natural wonder in chaotic crawl. It counts napalm and it counts nuclear warheads and armored cars for the police to fight the riots in our city. Yet the gross national product does not allow for the health of our children, the quality of their education, or the joy of their play. It measures neither our wit nor our courage, neither our wisdom nor our learning, neither our compassion nor our devotion to our country. It measures everything in short, except that which makes life worthwhile. <laughs>